Hey family, Pastor Darius here. Uh, I'm excited about this message. We're in a relationships series and I'm talking about something honestly I don't hear a lot of people talk about. We talk a lot about communication, but in today's message we're talking about comprehension. Somebody's got to do talking and we got to do a better job at that. But we also got to do a better job at listening. I'm going to show you how in this message. Enjoy. You really ready for relationships part two? Okay, we're getting ready to go there. John chapter 6, beginning at verse number 65. I want to read two verses from the New International Version of Scripture. John 6, verse 65 through 66 say this. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. Oof. Some people are going to have to go through God to get to you. Woo! From this time, though, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. I want to talk from this subject, 1130. Did you hear what I just said? Wait a minute, Clap your hands, family, if you're ready for part two. I want to leap into this lesson today with a question, just a question for your reflection. Have you ever found yourself in a situation or scenario where you said something, you wrote something, or you posted something, and after you finished with your communication, you engaged in some observation? You listened to what they said, read what they wrote back, or you watched what they posted. And you secretly and silently said to yourself, there is no way you got this out of that. Let me go to the side over here. I'm just looking for the honest section to date. You're not judging people. You're not questioning their ability. You're not, you're not calling into question their level of literacy. But at the same time, you are wondering, now, if I said that, how did you get this? Out of that. It's an interesting phenomenon because it says and suggests to all of us that the effectiveness of communication isn't just tied to communication. The effectiveness of communication is also tied to comprehension. The question isn't always what you said. Sometimes the question is what they heard. And until this reality is understood and embraced, it becomes impossible or improbable to shift any relationship. And I was having a conversation with my think coach this week that, that was a conversation centered around leadership. And, but he said something to me that I think applies to relationships. And when he said it to me, I said to myself, I got to say this to them. I know you're talking to me, but I think it applies to all of us. So can I say to you what my coach said to me th that caused me to say to myself, I need to say this to you? Yeah, yeah it, it's something that gave me a revelation on communication. This is what he said. He said, Darius, you're not talking to people. You're talking to they filter. <laughs> now, did you hear what I just said? He said, you're not talking to people, Darius. What you're talking to is their filter. What do I mean by filter? I'm, I'm, re I'm referring to this compilation of a person's experiences, their emotions, come on, and their assumptions that the compilation of their feeling, of their experiences, what's happened to them in the past. Their emotions, what are they feeling in the present? And their assumptions, assumptions that they have made about you, your intentions. The compilation of all of those things serves as a filter that impacts their interpretation of what you said. 
So sometimes what you said isn't what they hear. It's what the filter allowed to get through. Come on here. So if a person's if a person has this compilation of experiences that are negative, come on, and then they've got emotions that are negative, and then they're making assumptions that are negative, then the filter won't allow anything positive you say to get through. The filter blocks the positive, and the filter only receives the negative, and you're like, why are you going off of 1% of what I said, and you've ignored the 99% of what I said? It's because the filter only let the 1% get through, because you start looking for in the present what happened to you in the past. This is important because it means that whenever there's communication, both parties have to take responsibility for the effectiveness of it. Because your filter determines, excuse me, communication determines if you say it. The filter determines if they hear it. Your communication determines how you say it. Their filter determines how they hear it. Your communication determines when you say it. Their filter determines when they hear it. You could have been saying it since 2009. Over and over and over and over again. And then somebody else says it one time. After you said it 99 times. Now all of a sudden it's a breakthrough and an epiphany. I have been saying this the whole time. And what I'm saying is if we're going to shift relationships, we've not only got to work on our communication, we also have to work on our comprehension. Come on, talk back to pastor now. If relationships are going to shift, We not only have to do a better job talking. Come here, change. We've got to do a better job listening. We have to engage in the kind of listening that culture calls active listening. And comprehension is a fleeting and failing in many relationships, not because people lack intelligence. They lack active listening. We engage in passive listening. I'm just, I'm kind of, I mean, I'm here. (laughs) I'm here. We engage in passive listening, but active listening requires intentionality. Active listening requires energy. Active listening requires focus. Here's what the Bible says about active listening in James chapter number one. James puts it this way. James says, my dear brothers and sisters, Take note of this. He said, take note. Everyone should be quick to listen. Slow to speak. So watch this. So you got James trying to disciple people into active listening because even back then, Nothing new under the sun. Culture was discipling people into passive listening. See, we are being discipled by culture to be inattentive people. You can't even watch news on the screen without a ticker being on the bottom of the screen and something else being on the side of the screen. Come on, you can't even watch sports without a ticker being on the side of the screen and something else being on the bottom of the screen. We've been discipled into passive listening, not active listening. What's active listening, pastor? It is an act of love. I love you. Well, listen. Let me go over here. Who's going to talk back to me so I can preach to that side? Active listening is an act. See, love done God's way listens. 
It's an act of love, not just love, but respect. It means, come on here, it means you respect me enough to listen to me articulate to you something that matters to me, even if it doesn't matter to you. Now, pastor, why did you separate love and respect? Can, can I go here? I can, you give me permission to go here? Come on, you come here because you want real biblical application to real life issues, right? Because it's possible to love someone you don't respect. And what happens is sometimes disrespect doesn't manifest itself in disrespectfulness. Sometimes disrespect manifests in dismissiveness. You didn't diss me, but you dismiss me. I'm coming back. (laughs) You, you You didn't diss me, but you dismiss me. You disregarded me. Pastor, what do you mean? What do you mean, Pastor? Because when they said what they said, I nod at my head. No, 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 no. Relational comprehension isn't revealed in your agreement when we're talking. It's revealed in your adjustments when we're done. So, so don't just agree with me when we're talking, but not make any adjustments after we're done talking. I know you comprehend it, not when you shake your head, but when you shake some things up. It's an act of love and respect that honors the dignity of the speaker by offering undivided attention. You got my attention? Well, put your phone down. (laughs) Y'all not talking to me. Because what you're doing is you're allowing somebody else to interrupt our conversation. (laughs) Undivided attention by setting aside personal judgments. It means you shouldn't judge at all, but at least let me finish before you judge. Let me go. (laughs) I'm just trying to, right? Don't, 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 don't judge the validity of what I'm articulating because you don't need it. Because you're not in a relationship with you. The reason you want me is because I'm not you. So you can't want me because I'm not you, then get upset with me because I'm not you. When we first met, you were bragging about how thoughtful I was, how responsible I was, and now that I won't tolerate your irresponsibility, you're agitated by what you were attracted to. I got to set aside personal judgments and I got to seek, I've got to seek to not only accurately understand their words, but also the heart and the intent behind them. You got to try to do that. That doesn't happen automatically. You got to try to do that. That takes humility. And the absence of active listening will produce the presence of relational conflict. Some relationships break down because people can't get through to who they with. Sometimes the issue is not people aren't talking. Sometimes the people you with not listening.
This is why I would not advise anybody to be in a relationship with anybody that won't listen to God. Because if you don't listen to God, I am naive and borderline narcissistic if I think you won't listen to him, but somehow you're going to listen to me. If he can't get through to you, I can't stand a chance. These diamonds won't do it. The cars won't do it. They body won't do it. Y'all not talking to me. If God can't get through to them, now you do what you want. But good luck with that. Well, there's the absence of active listening. There's the presence of relational conflict. And guys, in all my years, in all my years, of reading, studying. I'm like a student of life. Like, I want to know what the Bible has to say because here's the quality of life is going to be based on three things. Principles, values, standards. PBS, principles, values, standards. When you look at the quality of a person's life, it's going to be a reflection of their principles, their values, standards. Principles are the truths you choose to live by. Not the truth you choose to hear. The truth you choose to live by. Does that make sense? Okay, so it is what you hear and what you accept as truth. Okay. You're going to live your life based on that. Okay. So for me, my principles have to come from God's word. Because okay. I, I don't trust people's interpretation of the Bible. I trust the Bible. Yeah. Right? I, I'm not going to build my relationship on whatever's trending. Yeah. I'm not going to build my relationship on whatever book is hot. Yeah. Just because it's hot don't mean it's right. Just because it's viral does not mean it's valuable. Some stuff is popular because it's not challenging you. It's confirming a bias. Not exposing some adjustments that need to be made. So it's the principles. So you can be a Christian, but have a life that's reflective of principles that aren't. So the Bible should be the filter you put all truth through, right? So it's a concept we call, they call it in, uh, call it in theological circles, sola scriptura. Not solo, sola, by scripture only, not scripture alone. It means scripture only determines what truth, what's true. It means there may be some truth that's not in scripture, but scripture determines if it's truth. So the Bible becomes the Supreme Court that you take all arguments to. And if the Bible is, if what they're arguing is out of alignment with the Bible, the Bible overrules the argument. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? So, so this, this has to be, the Bible's got to be the filter that you put all truth through. So the principles, you, the truths you live by, values, that's the things that you make most important to you. It's not what you say is most important to you. It's what you make most important to you. Because uh, there's proclaimed values, that's what you say. Then there's actual values, that's actually how you live. Yes, sir. And for many Christians, God first is a proclaimed value. But he really not first. <laughs> and then there's your standards. That's the least you allow from yourself and others. Your standards are not the ceiling. That's a goal. Your standards are the floor. Your standards aren't what you wish you have. Your standards are what you have to have. It is the least you allow from yourself and the least you allow from others. Your standard is, I at least got to have this. And people with bad principles, bad values, and bad standards will always have a bad life. You can't shout your way out of bad principles. You can't dance your way out of bad values. I wish I had somebody that would talk back to me today. 
So that's what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to introduce principles, values, and standards that shift relationships. And what I'm saying is there's a lot of talk, a lot of talk about communication in relationships. A lot of talk about talking. And there's not a lot of talk about listening. So it puts all the responsibility on the talker. But I was reading John 6. And John 6 taught me something. It taught me that the, that the, the quality of a relationship is not just based off what happens with the talker. But a quality of, the quality of a relationship is also based on what happens with the listener. I'm reading John 6 and I'm seeing something in, pl in a platonic relationship that can apply to any sort of relationship. I'm seeing Jesus having a conversation with some mentees that the Bible calls disciples. Okay. And the Bible says that he says something very ambiguous, dubious, cloudy, unclear. Unless you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no parts of me. Hold up, Jesus. Wait a minute. Then he gives them some commentary, kind of explaining a little further what he means. So, because he didn't want them to think he meant you got to chew on my calf muscle. So you got Jesus, the perfect communicator. Which means he always says what needs to be said. He always says it the way it needs to be said to that person. See, there's a way he talked to Peter that he didn't talk to anybody else. I don't, I don't even have time to deal with that. I don't even have time to deal. He, he talked to Peter in a way he didn't, he didn't let Peter get away with. What a lot, a lot of other, he said, get thee behind me, Satan, to Peter. He never said it to Judas who Satan was actually in. Did you hear what I just said? Because he knew enough about Peter to, hand, to know what kind of person can handle what type of communication. And say, Peter, what I'm getting ready to trust you with in the future, you got to be able to handle this. This, you won't be in position to handle what you're going to have to steward, the responsibility and the influence that you're going to have to steward when I am gone requires that, that I be able to shoot straight with you. I don't have to shoot it straight with them because I'm not leaning on them the way I'm going to be leaning on you. So I'm going to lean into you because I'm leaning on you. God Almighty. Did you hear me? I'm going to lean into you because I'm, leaning, I'm not leaning on Thomas like that. So I'm not leaning into Thomas like that because I'm not leading on Thomas. Thomas' gospel's not even going to make the Bible. He's a follower of mine who wrote a gospel, but it will not make the Bible. I'm not leaning on him like that. But Peter, every other gospel writer is going to write their gospels taking into consideration your account. Your spiritual son, Mark, is going to write the first gospel. And all the other gospel writers are going to pull from Mark's writing. He a perfect communicator. And a perfect communicator says something. And the Bible says they get so offended. We read it in verse 66. Many of them left and followed him no further. People left Jesus. I'm not saying we shouldn't pay attention to communication. I did a whole sermon on that last week. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about comprehension. John 6 tells us that no matter how you say it to some people, Jesus himself said it. They're like, I'm out of here. I can't take this. You left Jesus and you really mad about what you really misunderstood. Because Jesus wasn't talking to them. He was talking to their filter. I don't know what they heard 
another rabbi say. But maybe they heard another rabbi say some crazy stuff. And now they're interpreting what Jesus said through the filter of rabbi trauma. <laughs> so you have a relationship breakdown because somebody's not getting better at listening. And I know in relationships, we say, you need to get better at talking. I'm telling you, if it's going to shift, somebody has to get better at listening. Is this right? I know it's tight. It's tight, but it's right, Reverend. So can I give you five keys in Scripture to do this real quick? All right. Here's number one. Here's number one. Number one is this. If I'm going to listen better, I've got to fix my filter. So I'm looking at the New Testament, and Paul's one of my favorite writers. And Elder, I'm saying all this stuff in the New Testament where Paul's like, put on the new man, take off the old man. Like, I'm reading that, and it's almost like Paul is saying, hey, God's not going to do this for you. That's why I'm telling you to do it. God's going to help you do it. God's going to do it with you, but he's not going to do it for you. All of us in here, all of us in here have had some experiences that are painful. All of us in here have some emotional wounds from the past that are impacting us in the present. All of us in here make assumptions about what people mean before we give them an opportunity to actually explain it. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, the clearest place to see this is on social media, the comment section. Because, like, some people go off as, like, you should have just asked a clarifying question. But it is reflective of a social norm when it comes to communication styles. Because if they're not asking a clarifying question in the comment, they're not asking clarifying questions in their relationship either. Sometimes I see certain comments. I, I can't say that. That'll be too. Y'all can't handle that. Sometimes I, I see certain comments and I'm saying to myself, I'm really praying for whoever in relationship with you. Because that's what they're talking to every day. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> One of our core values here is health. And there's a clarifying statement. We deal with our stuff. That my stuff is my responsibility. That my spouse should provide a space for me to heal. They're not responsible for my healing. They can't serve a life sentence being imprisoned by my dysfunction for a crime they didn't commit. So she got to serve the time and the person who did the crime free. There is no getting better relationally until some of us get better emotionally. Because that's messing up the filter. So working on the relationship means working on my heart. And emotionally you catch sickness. You don't catch health. You have to try to be healthy. John calls this the prospering of your soul. Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul. My relationship can't prosper if my soul not. So how long you're going to make somebody you love suffer because you won't fix that. I know love suffers long, but how long? You know, sometimes people are like, we need to go to therapy when they should be saying, I. Somebody say, talk, Bishop. I feel the Bishop. I, 
I feel that bishop. <laughs> I, I. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Number two, I got to imprison the impulses. I'm not saying don't feel emotion. I'm saying monitor your immediate reactions so that you're not reacting over something you misunderstood. Uh, a few years ago, my oldest son, he was, uh, he was playing a football game. It was, it was an away game and it was in Florida. And so we're sitting, they didn't have like a designated visitor side. So we're sitting amongst all sorts of fans. So his number was number three, right? And so, uh, I don't bother nobody. I promise I don't bother nobody. I just relax. So my kids, I'm not, I'm screaming to encourage them, but I'm not like reprimanding them or anything like that. I'm going to talk to them after the game. Um, so I'm sitting there. I don't bother nobody, and I don't bother anybody else's kids. Now, I might whisper to my wife, he can't play. But I'm not going to say it out loud. Why is he on the team? But I'm not going to say that out loud. So we had a game. My son's name is number three. And I keep hearing somebody say, number three, you got a such and such and such. So I'm sitting there. Then it's like, number three, I said you got a such and such and such, such. So she know me. She knows a lot of stuff she ain't got to worry about with me. But that, temp, that thing, I keep it way over here. Right? I say, well, stay on the other side of the line. She started rubbing my back. Because she know me. Then he did it one more time. I look up around. I'm getting ready to say, who you talking to in tongues? And pray for me. I'm just, pray for me. And uh, there was a young man who was sitting next to me who was a father to another kid on our team who knew I was a pastor. He saw me. He said, Pastor, 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 Pastor. I guess he saw it in my spirit. He said, Pastor, Pastor. He's talking about the other number three. <laughs> I'm about to ruin my whole witness <laughs> over something I misunderstood. I felt real strong and I was wrong. So imagine if I would have went off on that brother. Now I got to explain myself to this other brother who knows what I do. And then I got to sit and eat humble pie when this man look at me and tell me, I don't even know your son. But how many times in relationships? Proverbs 29, 11, fools give full vent to their rage. But the wise bring calm in the end. Number three, arrest the arrogance. Arrogance creates a false sense of self and an inflated ego that makes it difficult to listen, to empathize, and to comprehend another person's perspective. It means a person is only open to hearing that which doesn't threaten or contradict the image of themselves that they've created. Arrogance is always the consequence of somebody that's grading themselves. You can't grade your own test. I'm humble. You kind of can't say that. <laughs> Number four, practice patience. <laughs> Some of the people are calling on Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Come on here, master. In the name of Jesus, I'm calling on you now, Lord. I need some patience. Come on. <laughs> See, 
some people, we got to be honest here. Some people process and then they speak. That's me. So, so sometimes if you're asking me what's wrong, I'm not being funny. I don't know yet. I know something wrong. But I got to process because I'm not a feeler like that, right? I got to process what I'm feeling so I can name the emotion. So I have to process, then talk. Some people process while they're talking. So they talk themselves into clarity. So you're like, get to the point. They're trying to. They're talking themselves into clarity. So whether you're with somebody that's got to process and then talk, or whether you're with somebody that processes while they're talking, you've got to practice patience. Because if not, you'll make assumptions about what you think they mean before they have an opportunity to explain it. They don't want to be confused. You missed it. They confused. They don't want to be. I want to be able to tell you what I'm feeling. I don't know yet. I just know I'm not right. I just know something's off. I just know something's missing. And if I had an answer, I promise you I would give it to you. This is why you need number five. You got to be willing to consult their creator. Because sometimes I remember Pastor Mika, we need to do something together with this because one time she said to me, she said, um, babe, you were asking me what I needed in that season. She said, I didn't know. So sometimes people are in seasons where they got needs they hadn't assessed yet. So if somebody been in a relationship and relationship cycles where people didn't really care about their needs, they don't, they don't know what to do when they meet somebody to care. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute, you, you thinking about me? <laughs> you want me to share my opinion? They have to become reacclimated to what it means to be in a relationship where they actually respect it. Because they know how to manage disrespect. But they don't know how to manage respect. We got to go. <laughs> They've been disrespected so much. They know how to do that. They don't know what to do with somebody treating them right. And some people have been treated wrong so long. When they get treated right, they call that person weak. He too weak. You just used to people disrespecting you. So there are times where I need to consult a creator. Say, God, I need you to show me how to minister to them. Help me see something they might not even be able to say to me. And some of the most significant shifts that have happened in my marriage over two decades, some of the most significant shifts were not initiated by conversation with each other. It came from words from God. I had to go to her recently and say, I'm sorry. Because in the midst of managing all of this, there is something that I miss. See, you, the standard for a bad relationship shouldn't just be mistreatment. It, it shouldn't just be I did something that I shouldn't do. It was I hadn't been doing all that I should and you hadn't complained because you understand but it don't make it right. Yes, 
Just because they understand doesn't mean it's okay. Shift. I had the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I had a, I do a lot of filming and content creation on Fridays and my schedule so crazy, so sometimes when, I've got, when I got breaks or whatever, I'm squeezing meetings in, and I started noticing something, I would be squeezing meetings in, and then those meetings sometimes would run over, and then a camera crew that I had set up um, waiting on me would be 15, 20 minutes, because I ran over a meeting, they just sitting waiting on me. And then one day, I got done filming, I was sticking around talking to some people, and I saw this gentleman that does some of the work for us, carrying stuff up. It was almost like an hour later. I was like, you still breaking down? He said, oh yeah. I said, take that long to break down. He said, yeah, Holy Ghost spoke to me. You're not honoring their time. They understand, but that don't make it okay. He got something else to do too. They didn't complain. God spoke to me. Yeah. You got to go. You got to consult the creator. And I believe if we do this, it'll shift some relationships. I don't know which one of these five things you need to do. But I pray that God gives you the grace to do them and to do them well. So, Father, I pray for wisdom and grace to carry out one of these five, two of these five, or all of these five. Give us wisdom on how to take what you've said to us and appropriately apply it to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, family.